Okay, I think we can get started. So first of all, I want to thank you all for coming to my talk. And I feel pretty excited to uh, give a talk in this artist hall. <laughs> so the paper I'm presenting is the misuse of Android Yumla to make sockets and security implications. I'm mean, Yerusha working with Professor Molly Mo and uh, Yun Jia at the University of Michigan and Arbor. This is uh, joint work with Jason Ott and Professor Jun Chen from University of California, Riverside. So as we all know, Android is actually built on uh, a tailored Linux environment. It reuses and customizes the Linux kernel. As a result, it inherits several IPC mechanisms from Linux, such as sockets, signals, pipes, etc. Uh, to facilitate the app interactions, Android also develops its unique IPCs, for example, intents, message handler, and so on. We compare the two categories of IPCs on Android in this table. And in AOSP, Android unique IPCs are mainly used for the framework and the apps. Well, Linux IPCs are primarily used by demons and the native components of the of, uh, of the framework. Detailed documentations are available for educating developers to securely use Android unique IPCs, but this is not the case for Linux IPCs. Thanks to previous work, like pr permission redelegation, I uh, used the security 2011, and Woodpecker, I uh, used the security 2012. We already have a very good understanding of Android unique IPC security. But we still haven't started Linux IPCs on Android, especially the security properties. We have seen several vulnerabilities reported that exploit insecure Linux IPC channels on Android. For example, CVE uh, 2011, 18.23 reported that a daemon allows local users to execute arbitrary code and gain root access. In fact, among all Linux IPC uh, available on Android, unit domain sockets are the only one being widely used in apps and system daemons. We went through media Linux IPCs available on Android and found that unit domain sockets are the only option that could support bidirectional communication have Java APIs provided by the framework and are, go are good for uh, cross-layer communication, uh, especially uh, communication across Java layer and native layer. Uh, well, signals uh, cannot carry much data. It's just used for uh, asynchronous notification. And then in sockets are usually used for kernel space and user space communication and it requires privilege to use them. And for pipes, they are majorly used, they are, they are mainly used for parent and child processes communication. So all three of them are not good for apps and system demands use. So we focus on unit domain sockets used on Android, and we make the following contributions in our work. We developed a sense vector for discovering misuse of Unix domain sockets on Android. And we performed the first study of Unix domain sockets. Uh, we categorized the usage. We surveyed existing security measures being enforced. And we also um, found common flaws you, uh, developers have made and uh, security implications. We also conduct an in-depth analysis and suggest countermeasures. Next, I'm going to talk a, bit, a little bit about unit domain sockets and where can easily go wrong with it. Unit domain sockets are designed for IPC between processes on the same host. Originally, on Linux, there are only two namespaces for socket addresses, uh, file system and abstract. But Android, I did another one called reserved. Uh, actually, reserved namespace is uh, some namespace of a file system, but socket addresses are located in a specific uh, directory, slash slash socket. 
As we can see in this table, file system sockets have socket files on the file system, and the socket channels could be protected by uh, file permissions. So, so do reserved uh, namespace. I see an Android policies could be made to restrict access uh, to both file system and abstract sockets. But due to current IC, uh, IC Android's limitation, it doesn't really work for apps, and I will talk about that later. Uh, in summary, for apps, abstract sockets are less secure, as there is less access control that could be imposed on the socket channel. So in our um, threat model, we assume that a malicious app with very low privilege is installed on the victim device. We believe this is very realistic because uh, using unit domain sockets only requires internet permission, and this is very uh, common permission that apps have. And attackers could repackage a, a popular app or just build a, a suspicious exploit app by their own. A vulnerable socket channel allows the attacker to be the man in the middle. For example, a rock server could steal sensitive data from the client. And a fake client could trick the server to execute uh, some commands or just in uh, inject data to the server. What makes the attacks easy is that uh, the, file, the proc file, slash proc slash nest uh, slash unix, is a public read readable file. In this file, all unit domain sockets uh, addresses are visible. So the attackers the attackers could easily locate um, victim apps. Although uh, less secure, Android APIs by default create abstract sockets. We don't really know why this is the case, but we suspect there are maybe two possible reasons behind it. First, abstract sockets are more reliable because if we use so, uh, file system sockets, and, and the socket files got accidentally deleted from the file system. Maybe all, um, all communications on the file, uh, relying on that uh, socket files will be interrupted. Another reason might be that abstract sockets are more convenient to use. Developers don't need to worry about uh, file system related stuff. After establishing a unit domain socket, uh, a unit domain socket connection, server and client need to perform authentication to prevent unauthorized access, especially for abstract sockets, because as I, as I mentioned before, there is no file permission access control on the socket channel. But in reality, uh, developers are not doing a good job on this. Maybe it's hard to blame, blame them uh, because online tutorials are quite misleading. If you Google unit domain sockets tutorial, you will find that the most popular one covers pretty much everything except for security. <coughs> so next, I'm going to talk about our approach uh, to detecting problematic apps and system demons that in involve misuse of unit domain sockets. <coughs> so the tool we developed it's called as inspector. It's able to vet apps and system demons uh, to find out those that are potentially vulnerable. The general idea is giving a set of apps and, and demons, we can gradually exclude those ones that are non-vulnerable. See, we have a set of apps and demons. Or well, we can first find out which ones are actually using unit domain sockets. It's, it's, it's easy. The next is we pick out those having insecure socket addresses, which means the socket channels are insecure. Next, we look at authentication checks. They apply and focus on those having weak authentication or uh, don't, even have, don't even have authentications. So finally, we examine the reachability of vulnerable code, and we can get a list of potentially vulnerable apps and demons. Here are uh, a few highlights in our analysis of apps. I'm not going to cover demons uh, due to time limit, and you can read section three of our paper for more details. In general, there are three questions which we would like to answer. 
uh, in order to exclude non-vulnerable apps. First, which apps are using you know, domain sockets? Uh, second, how to evaluate the security of a uh, socket address? Third, uh, which types of authentications are considered to be strong and which types are considered to be weak and could be bypassed? To answer the first question, finding out apps using unit domain sockets, we apply three criteria. First of all, apps need the internet permission to call socket APIs, so apps should require internet permission in, request internet permission in their manifest file. file. And second, it's obvious that APIs or system calls are supposed to be present in app, app's code. And third, the unit domain socket related code should be reachable from the entry point of the app. Because if the, the socket logic is not reachable, then it means uh, the logic won't be executed at runtime, so the app won't be vulnerable, actually. We also do socket address analysis, uh, which evaluates the security of socket addresses. Abstract sockets are, in, uh, are less secure, as I uh, said before. Um, however, file system addre uh, addresses could be vulnerable too because sometimes they could be, uh, the file permissions of the circuit file could be uh, wrongly configured. And one, ma one app may use different addresses for multiple unit domain socket channels. We need to distinguish them, uh, so we try to reconstruct socket addresses from code. And in some cases, socket addresses are just a constant strings. It's easy to uh, reconstruct strings. But in many cases, the, the, the addresses are constructed from uh, several parts. For example, in this code, the server socket listing now on an abstract address. And this address consists of a constant string and the value of the system time. And another benefit of doing this is we can easily find out common libraries apps are using according to socket addresses they are listening to. <coughs> okay, next, authentication analysis uh, inspects authentications an app applies. If an app is using unit domain sockets and its socket address is insecure, authentication will be, would be the last chance to prevent authorized access. If there is no authentication or the authentication is weak, that means the app will be vulnerable. Can a server uh, can get their PS credentials, which has three, uh, which has three uh, fields. They are PID, UID, and GID. There, there is an API for that. And we look at control dependencies between reading and writing operations between we will look at country dependencies, dependencies between reading and, reading and writing operations and credentials. PID-based authentication is considered to be weak because the process ID allocation is non-deterministic. Uh, we have implemented as inspector, and for the app code analysis, we built it on top uh, on top of I'm Android, which could. Uh, build intercommunal control and data flow uh, flows for us, and uh, as well as control and uh, uh, data dependencies. For native part, we leverage Ada Pro's disassembly engine and control flow analysis, and we build a, an extension. We currently only support 32-bit ARM, and we can only do intro procedure data flow analysis. We are working on the improvements. So. Next, I'm going to present our results and some interesting findings. So we have downloaded nearly 15,000 apps, uh, Google Play apps. And it turns out the majority, the majority of apps that are using unit domain sockets are, used, are actually using uh, abstract socket, uh, socket addresses. And we have identified we, uh, I think Spectre reported 67 vulnerable apps, but we uh, actually identified 45 uh, ones that are truly exploitable. For demons, we have uh, 60 demons from three rooted phones. 
here we can only use rooted phones because our analysis on uh, demands rely on root access. Uh, you could find more details on our in our paper. And we found 20 of them use reserved addresses, and nine out of 12 reported by as inspector are truly exploitable. <coughs> and the real world usage of unit domain sockets in ARPS are not limited to inter-process communication. They're also being used for implementing watchdog, where the server and the client build a unit domain socket connection and they monitor each other through that, connect, through that channel. Some apps uh, leverage unit domain sockets to realize single chain services and global logs. They take advantage of the feature that abstract sockets, socket addresses are only used exclusively. For example, if one process, one app has taken an abstract socket address, then no other process could uh, use that addresses anymore. <coughs> so this feature makes those apps uh, vulnerable to denial of service. See, we have app one running a push service, and the push service starts socket server and listen, uh, listen and listens um, an address. And we have another app, app two, having the same push service integrated. And this push, the, the, the push service in app two, we also try to start a local socket server and listen, listen on the address. But app, two will but app two will fail because the address has been taken by app one. So since the proof surveys are the same in the two apps, so they could share the same proof surveys to save energy. But the problem is if the attacker could manage to preemptively uh, take the address, then the proof surveys would be uh, dust because because proof services in, in the real apps could not uh, start. <coughs> and we have identified 12 libraries according to, according to such addresses they use. Um, 10 of them are using abstract namespace, while the other two, Amazon and OpenVPN, are using file system sockets. Uh, 12 spreads, only Facebook Stesso library has authentications inside. We also found that Qualcomm's time daemon checks client process name, which is a which is very weak authentication method. It allow, um, Qualcomm time daemon only allows commands sent, from, uh, commands sent from clients whose process name contains the constant string com.time service. But interestingly, apps can easily change their na process name to whatever they want because there is, a, it, there is a, an API in the framework for doing that. So although the, the API process.set are v0 is, 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 is a hidden API, which is marked by uh, at hidden. And hidden APIs are not visible in Android SDK, but actually apps can still make use of this hidden API by uh, uh, Java reflection. <coughs> Compared to process name checks, we observe several strong authentication methods. For example, GID, UID checks. Um, the client or the server will check if the, the if its peer has predefined UIDs or GIDs. So similarly, username checks look at pro, uh, peer process username. <coughs> Apps can also check peers permission, for example, uh, the uh, Facebook Stetson library only accept, accepts connection from ADB shell by checking um, uh, ADB shell permission, android.permission.com. Usually, uh, apps cannot have this permission. Another type of strong authentication is token-based. Canada server share, share a token through a secure channel, usually a permission protested, protested broadcast or a private file that only the client and the server could access. Um, the client or the server could deny access if they find that, if they find that the, uh, the, the peer does only the right token. 
And from our study, we summarize three common mistakes developers usually make. First, they sometimes intend to use file system sockets, but actually use abstract sockets. It's very likely that they just call the default APIs, which use abstract sockets, but they don't know exactly which namespace the API that the, the APIs are using. We found abstract addresses that are in that that are in fact file paths. For example, ES file explorer. It listens on an abstract address, which is actually a file path. The second mistake the developers usually make is some apps they they um, they choose file system sockets, but file permi the, these file permission of the socket file are, are wrongly configured. For example, Hideman API uh, VPN changed the socket file permission to global Reba and Red Bull. That means all other apps could talk to uh, hit my APN through the socket channel. Um, another example is RGAT uh, daemon, which allows access from apps in INET group. Uh, in fact, all apps that have internet permission are belong, uh, have internet permission belong to INET group. And last but the most important one is there is a lack of strong PR authentication in apps. Um, the implica the implica the implications of these mistakes are serious. Attackers are able to realize prevent isolation, data injection, data theft, or denial of service. Um, we have a few examples here. For example, um, we can exploit our GAT daemon to realize prevent isolation. And we can, um, so here, um, let's take Kinrod as, uh, as a concrete example and look at what mistakes its developers have made. <coughs> Kinroot has a root management module which processes root requests and grant root, root access to apps. And when, when an app requests root, it, it, it executes the binary SU. SU starts a unit domain socket server and listens listen on file system socket. And it, it asks for user decision. If Kinroot, if, uh, Kinroot will look up policies um, or, not, or notify the user if there's no policy available. And due to policies or uh, user decision, Kinroot app will send allow or deny to the SU binary. And if the user, if, if if SU receives allow, then it will grant access to the app, uh, grant root access to the app. And if SU receives deny, then the uh, root access will be denied. So, but the problem is that the app could just inject allow to SU, and SU will grant root access no matter what the user decision is or the policy is. The mistakes the members made was uh, our socket file permissions are wrongly configured because the file system socket are global ribbon and red ball. And there's no authentication when, ac when accepting root request decision. <coughs> according, to our uh, according to our study, we suggest three mitigation solutions. For apps, more fingering SE Android domain assignment is required. Currently, all third party apps uh, belong to the same untrusted app domain. They can access each other's socket channels. For system daemon, it's better to implement a proxy service for exposing domain function uh, for uh, daemon functionalities. See, we have uh, we have an app and uh, uh, system daemon, so we can make the system daemon denies deny all direct access from apps. Instead, we implement a system service as a proxy, and we can let the app send intents to the system service to, um, to forward um, the request to the daemon. And the daemon and uh, the, the, the system service and daemon could establish a unit of socket for uh, forwarding 
I have requests. <coughs> For apps that expose functionality to other apps through unit domain socket, UID and GID based authentications would be not applicable because the server does really know how does not really know who are potential who are potential clients and app, client apps. We think in this scenario, token-based authentication could be applied. So the client app could request a, a token to, from the server app, and the server app will ask for user decision. And if the user grant access, uh, the server app will reply a token. And they could build unit domain socket connection. In summary, we perform the first, uh, in summary, we perform the first study on unit domain sockets on Android. We present a tool for detecting potential vulnerable apps and demons. We reported high severity vulnerabilities. You can scan the QR code to see uh, some demos. And we conducted in-depth analysis and discussed mitigations in this work. So we'll sk the, skip the demos because we don't have any. OK, thanks. Uh, we have a time for a few questions. Okay, I think it's uh, and uh, I think it's a very interesting work. It is uh, uh, the, the the socket, uh, you know, unprotected domain socket. The problem is already known before, right? And uh, you guys did this study. I think it show show indeed, you know, just on different layer. Indeed, there, there is kind of problem. But do you think the problem is serious? Is extensive because you know from your study, it looks like uh, and um, you you study and uh, thirteen thousand apps, but mm -hmm. only find forty five. App indeed have this problem, right? So does that mean that indeed, although the problem is there, but it's not as extensive, not as pervasive as we thought? Oh, we didn't include libraries in, uh, in, in these numbers, because if we count for uh, libraries, the, for example, in some libraries, they are vulnerable, and we could dust them or uh, inject data or set, uh, steal data. And, we didn't include libraries in that number. OK, so if we can see the library, and uh, what's the percentage of the app indeed have this problem? I think we have this number. Yeah. Uh, you don't need to give me the detail, just what's the rough, what's the rough you know, just the range of the number? So there are 25%, around 25% that are using uh, unit domain socket. Yeah, but, but how many of them actually have a problem? And roughly? Roughly, maybe uh, five, or five, 5 to 10. 5 to 10%. Mm -hmm. OK. Any other questions? Uh, sorry, just one question. Did you find any malware actually starting to use this? We haven't started malware, but that's maybe one future work. Because we are very interested in the real world exploits that uh, leverage units to main socket vulnerabilities. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you all.